Welcome back, wrestling fans. Psychic Medium Angelo here. I have a very special guest tonight. It's going to be a really interesting topic. We're going to talk about breaking into the business, how, how to be a wrestler, what to do to make it to the big time in pro wrestling. The guy with me that's got 30 plus years experience in the game, and uh, you may know him as Armageddon, but I know him as Mike. This is Michael Murphy. A.K.A. Armageddon, A.K.A. Michael Payne. Mike, how you doing, brother? I'm good, Angela. Uh, it's good. Doing, doing real well. We're going to talk about, uh, you know, we have a lot of people. I'm sure you, people ask you all the time, how do I get started? What do I have to do? And we get the same kind of questions here at Wrestling to the Future. And so tonight I thought I'd dedicate an entire show to breaking into the wrestling business from the indie standpoint. Okay. So let's just, and I know your story and you have a really interesting story, but there's a lot of people watching this that don't know your story. So I like to bring you back in time. I know it's a painful place to go, <laughs> but I want to bring you back a little bit and, uh, and maybe, you know, talk about, you know, how you got started and, uh, and when the wrestling bug bit. So tell everybody uh, a little bit about how you got started. Okay, how I got started. Uh, let's see. Well, I was first introduced to professional wrestling uh, when I was about five, six years old. Uh, one of the neighborhood kids was watching it on, uh, I think it was uh, Channel 17 on uh, Saturday afternoon. And he was like, come here, you, you got to see this. And I come in, and here's these guys, uh, one, Chief J. Strongbow and his tag partner, Billy White Wolf. And they were uh, wrestling for the Worldwide, or Worldwide Wrestling Federation Tag Team Championships against the Executioners, managed by uh, Classy Freddie Blassie. Right. And I, I couldn't believe what I was saying. I mean, you know, I'm like, how how can these guys beat on each other like this? And right. and they're showing it on TV because yeah, remember going back then, you know, the, the TV was very uh, very docile back then. Yeah, you uh, mentioned the executioners. Do you know who they were? I haven't a clue. I I, I will tell you. Into my head. The executioners were, you ready for this? Uh -huh. Spiros Arion and uh -huh. Dominic Danucci under Dominic. a hood. Okay. I, yep. I did not know that at the time. Uh, but something about it interested me. Uh, something that I, I had to see what happened next. Uh, almost like a good book that you can't put down. You, right. you finish one chapter and you just got to read the next just to see what happens. And that's when the bug bit me. Kind of uh, like a car crash. Yeah, you, gotta you know. You got to slow down to see what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of people would equate wrestling to a car crash. <laughs> uh, car crash, train wreck, yeah, something yeah. Along, I've been along those lines. <laughs> so you got um, bit when you were a kid. Watching on, on uh, Channel 17, the Worldwide Wrestling Federation, Vince McMahon's daddy. Vince Sr., yes. And uh, and so you were, say, what, 10, 12 years old? And um, I was about, I'd say between five and seven. Oh, so you, you were younger then, okay. Yeah. Uh, and then there was time... Where my uncle, uh, Mike Murphy, uh, he's a former Hatfield police officer, uh, may he rest in peace. Uh, he had gotten an extra ticket to the Philadelphia Spectrum to for the wrestling matches that night. And I, I begged my mother if I could go. And finally, after, after annoying her for the next hour and a half, she finally said, just go. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Get out of here. Go. <laughs> One, I remember on that card was uh, Bob Backlund, uh, Pat Patterson. Uh, wow. Pat Baron was still Von, wrestling. Baron Von Roschka. Uh, 
let's see, Sergeant Slaughter. Wow. Um, and the main the main event was just coming out of retirement, Bruno San Martino versus Nikolai Volkov, managed wow. by Freddie Blassie. I begin to think Freddie Blassie played, played a major part in my wrestling life. Yeah, <laughs> no doubt. What year are we talking about, Mike? Uh, well, I'm uh, 53 now, uh, so I was 10 then. Uh, I'd say it was 1970, uh, six, 77, 78. Yeah. I was thinking maybe somewhere in mid seventies. Yeah. I, I think Bruno came back out for a short run. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe mid seventies to what, like early 81, maybe 82 before uh, he finally retired. Something like 79, 80, I think. Yeah. Uh, so now you 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 see your first live match, right? Right. That was well, my now, first time seeing a live show. Yeah. And, and it, you know, just level. you never. They say you never forget your first time. <laughs> well, I was sitting on the second level, and I knew then that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a pro wrestler. Uh, I just. At 10 years old, you don't know how to go about it. So I started in the living room practicing elbow drops and uh, taking, uh, you know, taking my own back bumps and that kind of thing. Practicing on your brother? Uh, no, nah, more like the uh, sofa cushions. Oh, there you go. <laughs> they didn't hit back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> And your brother's a cop, so he hits back hard. Well, he's uh, well, he was he was a, a lieutenant with the Pennsylvania State Police. Uh, he retired about two years ago, after uh, thirty years on the force. God bless him. Yeah. So, Mike, uh, how long before your your first match, and where you thought I might I could actually do this? Uh... Well, I started late in my career. I started my wrestling career when I was 30. And the, what happened with that was I was uh, getting some work done to my knee in a hospital. And uh, there was another gentleman in the room with me, uh, late Lou Roberto, may he rest in peace. Uh, and he was a indie wrestler. And... Right. I got to talking, and the next day he was leaving, and we were talking matches, wrestlers, that kind of thing. Right. He said, you know, he says, you know something, kid? He says, you're good size. He says, uh, you ought to try out. Well, I, I just kind of laughed it off. I figured, you know, nobody's going to, you know, pick me up. Well, right. he left the number, and I just... You know, I put the card away. I didn't think nothing of it for a couple of years. And then uh, I remember I was uh, singing at home with my wife at the time. And uh, I was watching East Coast Championship Wrestling. ECW. And, oh, no, it turned into extre ECW, Extreme Championship. Yeah. And uh, something just made me pick up the phone. And I called the number. And a couple nights later, the phone rang, and my wife at the time answered the phone, and she said, uh, honey, there's some guy on the phone named uh, Pretty Boy Larry Sharp. <laughs> what? what? Who? What? <laughs> right. And I the phone with him. I talked to him. Uh, he invited me to his gym, the Monster Factory, for a tryout. Right. Uh, unfortunately, after the tryout, uh, I found out how much it would be to get into the business, and I didn't have the money at the time. Right. So a couple of years passed. Uh, my wife and I came into some money, and I ended up training at the Wild Samoan Pro Wrestling Training Center up in Allentown. With Afa, Wild Samoan Afa. Afa and Hawaii, yes. Uh, and 
or anyone who's in the business knows him as Pops. Pops, yeah. Great guy, sweetheart of a guy. Just I I can't sing his praises enough. I think it's interesting that your first call was to a man who would later become a very, very dear friend of mine and would be instrumental in your career, pretty boy Larry Sharp, the late the late great Larry Sharp. He was a, yes. a very dear friend of ours. You know, my father had a bar in Camden, New Jersey. Right. And Larry was, uh, well, let's put it this way. He cashed in his frequent flyer miles frequently. <laughs> was his, was your father's bar about maybe a mile or two down the road from uh, Larry's gym? Yeah. Yeah, I've drank in that bar. You and every other wrestler in the neighborhood. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, a few years after I had uh, gotten into the business, I actually went over and trained a little bit at Larry's gym. Right. And after that, we would go down the road to the bar. I've drank in your father's bar. Oh, brother, let me tell you something. We had a huge wrestling clientele. Mm -hmm. We, I mean, whenever the guys were in town... Larry would make a and he was he was great for business for us. <laughs> Larry would bring everybody over to my father's bar, mostly for the happy hour, which was free food. Yeah, and wrestlers love free food. Well, hey, take a look. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember. That's funny. You had time for a quick little story. One night. He did a show at the Woodrow Wilson High School in Camden, in you know Camden, New Jersey, mm -hmm. rough neighborhood. The headliner was Cowboy Bob Orton versus the Junkyard Dog. Mm -hmm. Now Junkyard Dog was a hero, right? In Camden, great hell of a guy. Sylvester Ritter, rest in peace, great guy. That was he was my father's drinking buddy. <laughs> my father would have a mug and uh, and the dog would have a pitcher yeah <laughs> well anything anything worth doing yeah exactly exactly <laughs> but yeah um we had a lot of wrestlers come through the bar a lot of guys so larry uh basically he was overpriced for you at the time and then so you had a little bit of cash do you call uh, up uh, uh, Alpha, who was a little closer to you? Right. And he says, uh, so you want to be a wrestler, huh, kid? Uh, actually, that's pretty much what he asked me. No, he asked me, he says, uh, why do you want to be a wrestler? Oh, that's what I'd be interested in. What was the answer to the why? The answer to the why do you want to be a wrestler and I basically said, because I want to be out in front of a crowd. So you're a ham. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I know this. I'm, I'm, I'm saying this for the benefit of the people <laughs> that are watching. <laughs> I, 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 want, I wanted to be out in front of the crowd. Yeah. I like the glamour of it, the storylines behind it. All of it. I, I just I wanted to be a part of it, but I, I didn't want to be a part of it as a manager or a referee. Right. I wanted to be in the mix. Well, you certainly had the size for it, and you had the temperament, you had the look. So, uh, and I'm sure that you got in like instantly right away, right? Because you're you're that uh, good. I I didn't. My first match until a couple years after I felt I was good enough. Uh, and the funny story behind that there was a wrestler named Danny Steele, the dead end kid. Yeah, Danny, Danny Steele. Yeah, I know, I know well of whom you speak. Dead end Danny I Steele. I him at a bar one night and we got to talking. And he said, well, there's this guy I'm doing a job for uh, in a couple months. He says, let's go talk to him. We'll see if we can get you on the card. And I said, oh, okay. Well, who's this guy you're talking about? He said, oh, Hard Rock Hamilton. <laughs> oh, God. And I said, oh, I didn't know what I was getting into. And I said, okay. So we went and met with him. 
And here Hard Rock and I came out of the same gym. Uh, so there was a little, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Familiarity. Courtesy. Yeah. So he asked me to do this gimmick, which to this day, I couldn't tell you what it was. I never found out. Yeah. And he called me twice a week for about a month, two months. And asked me, you're going to be there. You're going to do it right. And I said, yeah, Rock, I'm going to be there. I'm going to do it. I, you booked me. I get to the show, and I everybody's in the back room. We're getting in our outfits. Well, Skip shows up 20 minutes late for his own show. Oh, gee. And Skip Hamilton, that's what everybody knew him as. Uh, right. Shows up 20 minutes late for his own show. The show had already started. Right. And he had given the gimmick that he harassed me for two months for to his nephew. Right. So I said, hey, that's fine. You, know, you book me. I'm here. You don't need me to work. Fine. Pay me and I'll go home. Give me my money and I'll leave. Exactly. Well, there was another wrestler slash manager there, uh, Captain Rick Adams, who I've known for a lot of years. And he saw what was going on. And he, he had just flown back into town for this show. I think his cousin had gotten married and he came back early to do the show. Right. And all what was going on between Skip and I, and he looked at me and says, look, don't worry about it, kid. You work for me today. He says, you'll be my bodyguard. Right. Okay. Uh, the end of the show, uh, Skip hands him $50, says, here, split this up between the two of you. $50. I, I, swore, <laughs> I, I swore then that I would never work for Skip Hamilton again. As I was leaving the arena... There was a gentleman, uh, Joe Labresco, went by the name Sniper. He owned the ring. And he says, hey, uh, I like the way you worked out there in front of the crowd, the way you worked the crowd. Right. Here's the card. He says, I got a show coming up soon. He says, I'd like to book you on it. I said, sure. And we talked, and he booked me on it. Um, I, I couldn't tell you who I worked. Uh, right. But, I mean, it was just, I put the guy over, you know, because I'm doing the business. I put the right. guy over. Local, local job guy. Uh, about a year or two down the line, I'm looking at the wrestling business, and I'm like, okay, if I'm going to do this, I need to do it more than once every six months. Right. Uh, now, now let, me, let me stop you there for a minute. So... You, th your introduction was less than cordial. Yes. You, you, you weren't greeted with the proverbial red carpet like you thought maybe you would. <laughs> and your first introduction is Hard Rock Hamilton, a real swell guy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's a sweetheart. A real, a real sweetheart of a guy. Uh, I'll reserve my comments. So, but in but in that you met a couple of guys that opened the door or two for you, right? I want you to tell young wrestlers listening to your story of what the telltale signs are to look forward uh, or to look out for, I should say, in promoters, fellow wrestlers that sound too good to be true. Guys that are offering them some substantial amount of money for basically a cup of coffee in the in the business. Guys that haven't been around long being offered, you know, sweet, sweet spots. You know, you know, and I know that just doesn't happen. Right. Um, my so what, advice is, that what does a, a young upstart look out for? What what do they need to be aware of? Uh, mostly, if they're talking with a promoter and a promoter is promising them, you know, hey, I'm going to give you titles and you're going to make this much money and we're going to make you a fan favorite and all. If it sounds too good to be true, it usually is. Yeah. Uh, take everything, everything with a grain of salt because, it, you know, nothing in the business is as it seems. In other words, believe none of what you hear 
and only believe half of what you see. The other thing that people should always be aware of, especially young would-be or wannabe pro wrestlers, and you and I have had this conversation previously, but they should be aware that everything in wrestling is a work. Wrestlers yeah, yeah. don't wrestlers only know work. They, they don't know they don't know the truth 95% of the time. They don't know the truth. They wouldn't know a shoot from a work or a wrist lock from a wrist watch if you showed them. And Basically. I'm not being disparaging to wrestlers. I'm being very honest. Oh, no, I'll, I'll be totally honest. Wrestling is a fantasy world. And That's you, what I want. You, you went right where I led you. That's exactly where I wanted you to go. It's, it's a fantasy world. And, and you get to live in it one, maybe two weekends out of a month. Three if you're lucky. Uh, but but back, back to what I was saying, I did, I think my first official match with an actual company. I went to a local promoter here, uh, a gentleman by the name of Dino Santa. He's, uh, He's a, a, a local promoter for those of you watching and listening. Dino Santa is the president and owner of the Worldwide Wrestling Alliance, commonly called the Triple WA. Yes. He's yes. a regional promoter in Pennsylvania. Very mm -hmm. nice guy. Very. He's got a good reputation. Mm-hmm. By and large, but he's a promoter. Let's keep that in mind. I went to work for him, and I did my first official match. Uh, at, it was a fire hall, and I wrestled uh, Wolfman Baker. Right. And we know him as Wolfie. Wolfie was, was uh, nice enough to uh, put me over that night. Wow. Uh, yeah. Uh, my for I what I call my first official match. And right. he was nice enough to put me over. Um, and he worked with me. He showed me, okay, you've been in the business this many years, but you're still raw. I want right. to work. He showed me, you know. What advice did he give you? What was the best advice you got from him, Mike? Best advice I got from him was don't take it too seriously. In other don't, words, don't believe your own bullshit. Yeah, don't take it too seriously. He said, if you take the business too seriously, and he says, it's going to drive you nuts. Yeah. And he said, go out, have fun. He says, learn what you need to learn. Listen to the other guys in the locker room. Right. Listen to the older guys in the locker room because they're the ones that have the experience. The grizzled veterans. Right. He's, of which you are now one. Yes. One, That's why I want young guys now, Mike, to listen to you. You're, you are now where they were. You're the grizzled veteran now. You've right. got the road scars, you know, or sh I should say tire tracks, yeah. <laughs> you know, to, to, to show for your wear and tear. Right. And... It, it basically one one piece of advice that I could give any young wrestler coming up in the business never ever if you're booked to work a veteran of the ring that night never ever tell him how the match is going to go right. never tell the veteran how the match is going to go let him Absolutely. tell you how it's going to go show the veterans the guys who came before you, show them the respect they deserve. Because if it wasn't for them, you may not be in that ring with them that night. You may not have never gotten to where you're at. Well, they had we, they did. We, we should be reminded of a very young green Lex Luger mm -hmm. who stepped into the ring with a very large, very angry, very irate Bruiser Brody. <laughs> who then proceeded to tell Mr. Brody what he was going to do. 
You didn't tell Frank Bruiser Brody anything. Right. He told so you. He didn't want to hear it. He didn't want to hear it. Yep. So he taught Lex Luger a lesson. He sat up on the turnbuckle and let Lex Luger wear himself out. Mm -hmm. And when he wore himself out, Bruiser Brody left the cage, walked back down the aisle, and went home. Yeah. He still got paid. So I think your point is well taken. Don't tell the vet what to do. I And I had that happen to me. Uh, I was in Dillsburg, PA, at the big event center. I, I couldn't tell you the name of the guy that I wrestled. Uh, I was talking with one of the other wrestlers. I was lacing up my boots. And we, we were talking about, you know, nothing in particular. And this kid comes in with his manager. He's like, hey, Armageddon, it's you and me tonight. Okay, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. And this will be the turnaround. Then we're going to do this and this. And there will be another turnaround. And, and I'm just looking at him like, uh-huh. <laughs> And then I turned around, I looked at him, I said, well, how about we do this? We're going to get in the ring. The bell's going to ring. I'm going to crush the shit out of you. <laughs> I'm going to get a shower, get dressed, and I'm going to go home. And then you're going to go home and have a beer. Yeah. And <laughs> I, I said, how does that sound, Junior? Good. Nice talk. Dang and, I go, and I walked away. And as I'm walking away, the other wrestler looked at him and said, congratulations, kid. You just managed to piss off the nicest guy in the locker room. You know what I find? <laughs> Here's the thing, Mike, that I find most interesting about that story. Mm -hmm. That he walked in with his manager. Yeah. <laughs> okay? Yeah, his Here's manager, a guy. His Here's manager. a guy nobody knows, and he's walking in with his manager. Yeah. That's funny stuff. Oh, yeah. So and let's let's fast forward a little bit. We're going to tie into that. Okay. Um, so now you're in the business a little while. Uh -huh. You start making a name for yourself. People start noticing you. Mm -hmm. Is there a point in time where you started believing your own bullshit? Oh, yeah. Come on. It's... It if you don't believe your own hype every once in a while, you're either dead or... Or you have no ego. ...in the business at all. Yeah, exactly. Let's face it. We are... The biggest mark for a wrestler is himself. Thank okay. you for saying that. I am... I am. <laughs> it was worth this interview just to hear you say that. <laughs> we, are. We, are, we are the biggest marks for ourselves. I mean, it, how can I put it? Uh, we are the most egotistical, self-loathing, self-centered marks for ourselves. And when I say self-loathing is because we hate our, we, we're, we love ourselves because we think we're the shit. Yeah. We hate ourselves when we don't when, think we big enough pop. Yeah. And, we're so self-centered that we look at both of those and try and combine the two. And that's an interesting thing to hear you say that. You know, I heard Jim Cornette say, and I thought this was a really simple, very astute observation. He said, we used to pretend the fight and had people believing that it was real. Now we kill each other for real and everybody thinks it's a work. Right, yeah. And yeah. then he proceeded to say, the marks used to be in the audience, now they're all in the business. And truer words were never spoken. And I'll tell you what, I love Jim Cornette. I could watch that, I could watch that man cut promos from dusk till dawn and never get bored with it. I love Cornette. He's the best. He's the best. He's the, he's the anti-Russo. <laughs> you, oh, well, watch a video sometime of what he thinks about John Laurinaitis. Oh, Jesus, please. <laughs> I 
I think he said one time about Laurinaitis. He says, Laurinaitis, let me tell you something. When you can't, when you were born, the stork slapped your mother. <laughs> Mike, how, let me ask you a question. How difficult is it? I'm going to switch the serious gears over here. Okay. How difficult is it? Not only, and we talked about, you know, believing your own bullshit, right? Mm. Believing your own hype. But how difficult is it to remain grounded and not get sucked up in this, the ground swell of the booze, the girls, the drugs, oh. the whole, that, that whole, you know, quote, wrestler lifestyle, unquote? That is, uh, now, you know, they say, well, the wrestlers in the big time, um, but it, it's not just the big time. It's the indie circuit, too. It's some, worse on the indies. I think it's worse on the indies. Some of these places where you do shows at, the, uh, I remember I did a show at the Venetian Social Club in Chestnut Hill. And downstairs, they had a bar. Right. And after my match, I decided, well, I'm going to go down and grab a cold one. Well, the show had ended, and some of the people were coming downstairs. I don't think I paid for one drink the whole night. All they wanted to hear was wrestling stories. and yeah, sure. And once that happens, it, it's fun. I, don't get me wrong. It's fun at first. Sure. Have a good time. Yeah. And as you definitely meet some, you know, women or ring rats, you know, sure. on the road. And and it, and again, it's fun. You're like a rock star at that time because everything's available to you. You you and, mentioned that you mentioned that rock star lifestyle. Well, yeah. And we Ever you know we 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 know guys, you and I have known guys personally that have got sucked up into that rock star lifestyle. Some of them aren't here anymore to talk about it. And that's that's the line. The line happens from when you're in the ring, you're beating the hell out of your body, you take an injury. Well, you've yeah. got another show that you're booked on next week, so you've only got a couple days to heal up. Right. Not a lot of time. So you're doing whatever you can so you can keep your spot at that next show. Absolutely, yeah. Well, then after a while, that the painkillers stop working. So you start mixing it with alcohol. Right. And that works for a little while. Well, then that stops where you start mixing it with street drugs. And by the right. time you get to that level, you've drank and drugged yourself out of the business. Nobody wants to book you because they don't think you're going to show up. You're not trustworthy anymore. Exactly, exactly. And next thing you know, instead of being on the inside looking out, you're on the outside looking in wondering what the hell happened. And there's another added component to this that we haven't even touched on yet, which is you're responsible for another guy's body in that ring. Oh, yeah. You're, a, a man is trusting you with his body. Mm-hmm. We've seen time and time again, guys get severely injured. Guys have gotten killed in the ring from oh, got, stupid stuff. <laughs> I mean, let, we can we can just you know let's just point to recent memory. You know, Darren Drozdov, and a lot of people are saying, "Well, who who the hell are you talking about, Darren Drozdov?" Yeah, exactly. There's a reason you've never heard of Darren Drozdov. Because his career was shut, you know, he was basically the door was shut on his career before it had a chance to really flourish. Yeah, he, he took broke over. his neck in, in the ring. He was wrestling uh, D'Lo Brown. Right. Took a power bomb the wrong way. Well, and a lot of people have their speculations as to why. Some people think D'Lo was, may have been a little coked up. I, I don't know that there's any proof of this. I'm just I, yeah, I mean, what's been repeated. Um, but I will say this, that we know as wrestlers, first off, if you go, if you get into the business and you think you're not going to get hurt, mm -hmm. you're fooling yourself. 
Like exactly. I said, I've got a medical file about that thick of broken bones, torn ligaments, separations, right. uh, spinal compressions, blown out knees. Uh, you know, my, my chiropractor wonders why I'm even able to stand upright and walk. Right, sure. From all the damage I've done to myself. We all know as wrestlers, once you step out from behind that curtain, there's no turning back. Well, no, I mean, it, and it's again, you know, giving your body to another guy in a ring and being responsible for each other. You know, it's one thing to get hurt knowing that the guy you're working with is stoned or drunk. Yeah. It's, but it happens with guys that are perfectly sober. You can get, look what happened with Bruno Sammartino and Stan Hansen. Well, see, that's what I was saying. It only takes a split second or miscalculation. Exactly what happened. Nothing from the neck down. So talk to the young upstarts, the young, the young boys today that are serious about getting into the business. What's their first move? Before they put up, before they put up their boots, before they pull up their trunks, what's the first move? You, I mean, you can go buy tights and boots and call yourself a wrestler all day long, but that doesn't mean you're qualified to wrestle. What's the first thing a guy has to do? Find an accredited wrestling school. The Monster Factory. The Wild Samoans. Uh, I, I, unfortunately, those are the only two. I know uh, Wolfman Baker trains people. Um, find, or find a wrestler right. who is not just going to take your money, but is actually going to teach you how to bump, how to hit the ropes, how to hit the turnbuckles, how to do, you know, how to know the difference between a, a hammer lock and a wristwatch. Uh, exactly. you know, find somebody who you can trust, who isn't going to take your money, and who's going to teach you how to do, do it and do it safely. But don't right. kid yourself. You, you get into the business, you're going to get hurt. It's, oh, absolutely. It's not a matter of, of if, it's a matter of when. The so under while, we're, while we're plugging wrestling schools, let me put a shout out to our friend Austin Idol in Florida, who has a, uh, a fabulous wrestling school in Florida. So look up if you want to check it out, go online. It's Austin Idol, I D O L A U S T I N, Austin Idol Wrestling School. Uh, check it out. Also, oh. I quote The Undertaker. Sometimes you step between them ropes, bad shit happens. That's it. That be prepared for it. Yeah, you know, be prepared for it, kids, because it's going to happen. Uh, but no, my my first piece of advice is your first step is before you buy boots and tights and you know you're starting to come up with a gimmick for yourself. Well, my advice is find a wrestling school, train at the wrestling school work out, watch your diet, you know, that kind of thing. Stay away from the booze and the drugs. Right, absolutely. You know, well, because, I want to ask you a question. I'm no, I've known you the better part of over 20 years now. Right. And I've never asked you this question. Okay. Give me your real, true, innermost thoughts. All right. What do you think of backyard wrestling federations? <laughs> uh, one, I think they're a joke. I think these kids are killing themselves, thinking that they're going to get to the big time uh, by beating the hell out of themselves, mutilating themselves, uh, you know, in their backyard. Exactly. And, and and they're not. They they make tapes, and you and I both know because we've done it. Yeah. They make they send them to promoters, and we oh, sit there and watch them and laugh at them. And Mike, I remember, and I'll I'll tell everybody a story, a personal story for me that involves you. 
And those of and then most people know my background, but for those that don't, I promoted wrestling for the better part of 20 years. I was the owner of NCW All Star Wrestling back in the day. Former heavyweight champ. There you go. <laughs> Mike Murphy and I sat one day and went through pictures and resumes and tapes. And of the probably 40 or 50, we, I think we may have kept three. Three or four. Maybe three or four out of yeah. like at least 50. Because yeah. the stuff that people were sending us. Was and I thought to myself as I'm watching this, who's the first question I always ask? Who trained you? Yeah. Who trained you? Mm -hmm. Because if you really want to be a wrestler, if you're that committed to doing it, I know a dozen good places to send you. But don't tell me that you were your the backyard heavyweight champion of Avenue G or you know, of Scott Boulevard, you yeah. know, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> yeah, well, as The Rock would say, you're the heavyweight champ of Jabroni Drive. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, so, again, back to my question. So, what are your thoughts about these, these backyard indie guys slash extreme hardcore, because, I mean, you mentioned it in your comment. These guys are mutilating themselves with, with fluorescent tubes and glass and weed whackers and, oh, I mean, God, you name it. I mean, my, my thing about them is, uh, and th and this is no disrespect because there are a couple of guys who started off doing backyard wrestling who made it to the big time. One of them being CM Punk. Uh, he even admitted that he did backyard wrestling when he was younger. Yeah. Sick Most, Nick Mondo. They're, mostly they're a joke. Yeah. A joke. An yeah. absolute fucking joke. Because, uh, you know, we as wrestlers, we're trained. We know what we're doing. Yeah. Okay. We're getting paid to do what we're doing. These guys are killing themselves, crippling for, themselves. For free. Yeah, for free. Yeah. For the neighborhood kids who they're charging a buck to come and watch. Yeah. And I, I, there's even a couple uh, indie wrestling movies out. I, I couldn't tell you their names because I, I think I watched it all for about maybe 10 seconds and couldn't watch it anymore. But it shows what these guys are doing with barbed wire and light bulbs and pyrotechnics. and it's, if, really? if you, While we're plugging movies, if anybody wants to see a really interesting movie starring the uh, extreme hardcore icon, Sick Nick Mondo, <laughs> there's a, a great movie, the documentary called The Nick Mondo Story. Mm -hmm. Nick Mondo, by the way, is now producing and filming movies and television commercials. In fact, his he did, for those people listening, he did the John Moxley break out of prison video when he left the WWE. That was directed and filmed by sick Nick Mondo, whose real name is Matt Broom. By the way, yeah, very very nice guy. By the way, hell of a nice guy. I had a chance to meet him a couple times. I uh, but no, the uh, these backyard guys, you know, they they got the nickname Yard Tards. Yeah, that's, that's what they are. You know, they're yeah. never going to big time. They're never going to hit the Indies yeah. unless they go to a accredited wrestling school. Mike, let's let's take that and tie that into what we're seeing now on a nationwide level with AEW. There are people who say that AEW is nothing more than backyard with money. No. 
No. Okay, tell me, tell me what you think of AEW. Uh, uh, well, in fact, while we're at it, let's just let's just talk about AEW and NXT, NWA Power, Raw, SmackDown. Let's let's just throw everything into the mix and and get it all out there. Uh, well, let's see. You have a uh, Raw. Yeah, Monday Night Raw, Friday Night SmackDown, both owned by Vince McMahon. Uh, for you know, of course, that's the pinnacle. That's where every wrestler wants to go. Right. You have uh, AEW, which, as far as people calling AEW backyard with money, no, not even close. Uh, first off, uh, Cody and Dustin Rhodes would never, ever let a backyarder in there. Yeah, they would never let somebody who isn't properly trained. That, you know, and that's, that, that's just a well, bottle. And that's a perfect segue, Mike, into this question. How do you explain or can you explain the use of a legless person uh, in the ring uh, and someone like, uh, Marco Stump, who is all of uh, four feet tall, but yet he's not a dwarf or a midget. He's a fully grown, developed young man. 20, maybe 21 years old, maybe. Maybe 21. And I'm, because he looks like he's about 12. <laughs> I really couldn't tell you. I think work for AEW. Yeah, he was he was actually in the ring last week in Philadelphia. I you know I only caught a few minutes of that. I don't really get to watch wrestling uh, like I used to, mostly because of my odd, my odd hours. Like you said, I'm usually up at three in the morning. Which we um, will be getting you out of here soon too. By the way. Oh, that's fine. No, no, no. I'm fine. But I, uh, so I don't, I don't really get to watch a lot of it. I, I might get to watch maybe 15 minutes, 20 minutes of it. Uh, so this, so this person you're speaking of, uh, I haven't had a chance to see him. So I, I really can't comment. Okay. If you have a chance, Mike, take out your phone sometime while you're on the road and just, uh, Google Marco Stump. But on, but on the other hand, now, if you think about it, Vince had a kid that had one leg and worked for him. Oh, yeah, it's, uh, Zach Gallen. And also, wasn't, um, wasn't, didn't Kerry Von Erich wrestle with a prosthetic? Yeah, well, he had a prosthetic foot. Yeah. But, yeah, that was all kayfabe, though. Nobody ever knew it. The people in the business knew, of course. But the fans never knew that that Kerry's leg, well, not his leg, but his foot was severed. Well, I I would say, and like I said, not knowing this person, so I can't speak of him. But on the other hand, you know, hey, he's chasing his dream. God bless him. I wish I wish him the Good. best of luck. Good, terrific. So uh, uh, you you've had a chance to see some of the product. Admittedly, not a lot of it. What do you think of wrestling in 2019? Uh, I think wrestling in 2019 has gotten tired. Wrestling, That's interesting. That's an interesting comment. Wrestling has always gone in peaks and valleys. Yeah. Uh, for like 10, 10 or 15 years or so or better, it'll be all the way up at the top. Then it'll slowly decline. And then nobody's interested. Then all of a sudden, it'll shoot right back up to the top again. Yeah, I think uh, I think there are some wrestlers out there that are getting saturated. The uh, when when I say that, I mean the industry is getting saturated with them. Yeah, uh, too much of them. Yes. Uh, I mean, Rod, the late Roddy Piper said it best: nine times out of ten. Less is more. Piper also called the wrestling business, he called it the sickness. 
of the mind. The sickness, yes. <laughs> and he should know. Rest in peace, Roddy. Roddy. And, you know, I, I had the pleasure of meeting Roddy uh, on a couple occasions. And Roddy was the type of guy that if he met you and he liked you, he made sure he remembered your name. Right. First time I met him, uh, I had gotten a picture together with him. <clears throat> Excuse me. I had gotten a picture together with him, and I told him I was an indie worker. And he's like, oh, hey, kid, that's great, man. You know, good luck to you. Stay strong. You know, keep doing what you're doing. You know, your day will come, you know. Uh, and then it was about two, maybe three years later, I met him again. And I said, hey, Hot Rod. And he turned around, hey, Mike, how you been? He actually remembered my name. He actually committed my name to memory. Wow. Uh, which is what he did with everybody. If he liked you, he would make sure that he remembered your name. He didn't want anybody yeah. to feel that, okay, yeah, here's your autograph, 20 bucks, boom. Yeah, he, yeah. he was like that. Yeah, I actually saw the the two pictures that you were speaking of. I uh, I saw the uh, the earlier picture with Piper you have, where he's got kind of a couple days stubble on his face, yeah. and one where he's clean shaven. Well, that one was uh, the picture that was autographed. Uh, that was both on the same day. Oh, okay. Yeah, I met him. He took a picture with me and autographed the picture for me. Oh, I got you. Okay. And I and I'll tell you what, there's a lot of a lot of friends out there of mine that would kill to have that picture. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Uh, so, I think wrestling has gotten. I think it's gotten a little tired. Uh, we're seeing the same storylines, only with a different twist on them. I've actually gotten to the point to where. I'll watch, and not just because of the outfits, but I'll watch and enjoy the women's division better. Really? Than the regular roster. Now, that's really interesting because most people, when polled, said that they did not like the women's wrestling. They thought that the women took away from the wrestling product. Because it was male dominated, male oriented. Well, it's very no. interesting to hear you say that you like it. I mean, let let let's go back and look before Glow, gorgeous ladies of wrestling. Yeah, sure. How many women wrestlers did we have that were famous? Um, the Moolah. fabulous Moolah and her stable. And her stable, May Young. When Meg we were, Young, Fabulous Moolah, Judy Martin, Donna Christinella, Leilani Kai. Wendy Richter. Oh, Wendy Richter. I forgot about Wendy. Uh, but yet. But not a, many more, to be honest with you. It probably, and I'm not exaggerating when I say this, probably eight women, maybe. Maybe. But now look at it. Oh, God, there's. 20, 30 women on the roster. The man, Becky Lynch, uh, Charlotte Flair, Sasha Banks, Bailey, uh, the Kabuki Warriors. Uh, you know, I mean, sure. yeah, I, and these women are all highly trained, very good at what they do. I myself happen to be a bit of a Bailey fan. Uh, <laughs> so what do you think of Bailey's heel turn? I like it. I like it. I think it's been something that's been coming for her for a long time. I was just going to say people have been waiting this for years now. Three, four years for Bailey to flip the switch. And she did it perfectly. I, I think that, that the, way they, the way they flipped her heel... Was it was like watching a ballet? Yes, it was a perfect dance. Now, since we're on the women's section of professional wrestling, right? We've seen many women go into the WWE Hall of Fame. Yes, uh, all of them well deserved. There is one person 
that is not in there. I happen to be associated with her and her husband. Uh, her husband, a uh, gentleman by the name of Chad Bird. Uh, he's a wrestler down in North Carolina. And his wife, Nicola Baby Doll Roberts. Right. If, if there is a woman in professional wrestling that more than deserves to be in the WWE Hall of Fame, it's her. Baby Doll was doing a lot of what valets and all what a lot of before the women's uh women's uh revolution no um i can't think of the word the women's section of professional wrestling oh okay division that's the word i was looking for. women's division okay gotcha before they came to be you know they were known as the divas oh yeah i had a problem with that whole diva thing nicola or baby doll the perfect 10 baby doll yeah. Uh, you know, uh, valet to Tully Blanchard, the four horsemen, her name, JJ Dillon, her name goes right along in with that greatness. Oh, sure, sure. And, and her mother, and she was a big girl, too. Her mother and father, both professional wrestlers, right? Grizzly Adams, Grizzly I mean, Adams. Uh, Grizzly Smith, Grizzly Smith. Her cousin, uh, Jake Roberts. Jake the Snake. Yep. I mean, why isn't she in WWE Hall of Fame? That's a really good question. But I, 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 I have no answer for it, but I think it's a great question. But uh, yeah, I, uh, I I had a good. I'd say I had a good career. Um, I've won my share of titles and. Had my share of feuds and uh, well, stuff. I'll tell you what, Mike. We're 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 just beginning to scratch the surface of your career. I know, however, that this is uh, kind of past your bedtime. So thank you for staying up late for me. Not a problem. I'm here as long as you need me. What I would like to do is to schedule a part two with you. Because we've got an hour under our belt right now, and I don't want it to go any longer than this, uh, you know, because you are, you know, you're, you're, you're up there now. You're not a young <laughs> whooper snapper no more. Well I, well, I remember what snap, crackle, and pop is what I had for breakfast, not what I did in the morning. Exactly, brother. <laughs> But but you know, Angelo, a uh, couple a uh, couple things before I go before we wrap sure. this up. Uh, there were wrestlers that I didn't get along with in the locker room. I'm not going to say any names because I still don't get along with them, uh, and I'm not going to give them I'm not going to give their name any airtime. Good. Uh, there is one wrestler I would like to say you know send a shout out to. Uh, his, his birthday happens to be today. Uh, goes by the name of Ravage, and uh, he also went by the name of uh, Bodacious Brad. I know Bodacious Brad. I gave him that name. And brother, if you're watching this, I wish you a happy birthday. I hope everything goes your way. I love you. Much love to you. God bless you. And if you're watching this, Brad, or if you're hearing this on Podbean, give Pop a call. Everybody has my number. All right. I said what you wanted me to say. When do I get my money? <laughs> <laughs> Typical worker. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I like I said, I've had I've I've had a good career. Uh I don't think I'd change anything in it. Um I did find out recently that uh a manager of mine, Tim Schaefer. Uh, I found out from uh, another wrestling manager who's unfortunately not in the business anymore, Chucky e. D. He uh, sent me a message uh, the other day. Right. And let me know that she had passed. Ah. Oh. So my uh, my condolences go out to uh, her daughter, Christy, and, you know, to her family. Uh, I'm hope she, I hope she's at peace now. Okay. Well, you know, we uh, we'll give a, a a ten bell salute in our heart, 
And uh, at the end of this video, when I upload it, I will make sure that there is a audible 10 bell salute in her right. honor. Appreciate that. You got it, brother. Well, listen, I'm going to let you head out of here. I do want it right now while I have you on the air. I want a commitment for part two. Just name the time and place and I'll be there. You got it, brother. All right. And this time the gloves come off. Don't be such a nice guy. <laughs> I'll tell you what, next time, no holds barred. Beautiful. Mike, you have a great night, my friend. We'll talk again real soon. Do the same. And to all the fans out there watching this, you guys have a good night and God bless. From everybody here at Wrestling with the Future, Psychic Angelo signing off. Good night, everybody. Happy wrestling.